What is going on guys? Welcome back. In today's video, we're going to learn what's new in Python 3.11. So let us get right into it. All right, so let's get started. Now, if you want to follow along with this video, if you want to play around with the latest Python version, instead of just listening to what's new, you can go to python.org and download it from here by clicking on this button. Um, and you can also have multiple Python installations. So you can have if you go to my start menu, you can see I have Python 3.11, Python 3.9. I also have some Anaconda environments, as long as you know which version you're currently using, this is not a problem. Uh, but if you want to try out the new features, you obviously have to use Python 3.11. Also, I would recommend you to go to the documentation and look at this what's new in Python uh, entry here, because here you get a detailed listing of all the changes, all the updates, all the improvements. Uh, with every little detail, all the minor changes. And in this video today, obviously, I'm not going to cover all of it. I'm going to limit myself to everything I think is useful, interesting and valuable to you guys. I want to keep this video short, concise and simple. So I'm not going to cover all the minor changes and all the stuff that I think uh, most people will not use. So I'm going to focus on the interesting stuff that you will probably use and you will probably benefit from. And the first thing I want to mention here is something that we cannot really talk too much about because there's not much to show here. I'm not going to do some fancy benchmarking because it has already been done. But one of the biggest improvements of Python 3.11 is the speed up. So on average, you get a 25% speed up compared to Python 3.11. And the range is here between 10 and 60% as the documentation says. So again, I'm not going to show any fancy benchmarking here because you can see um, uh, everything that was changed and everything that was done here. And you can um, read about the speed improvement here in the documentation. But in general, Python 3.11 is now faster than Python 3.10, which is a very good uh, trend to see because Python is always considered to be a very slow language in terms of execution speed. And every improvement here is very beneficial to the language. So this is one of the biggest improvements here. Now, the first actual thing that I want to show in this video here is the improved error messages. So what we can do here, is I'm going to open up the idle, just so we can do some coding. So the 3.11 idle, and I'm going to open up the file that I have prepared here. I don't know if there's any code in here already. So this is a function that I prepared. Um, very simple, we have some numbers, we have divisors, and we have a list comprehension. So we just have a simple function that um, takes this list of numbers and divides it by this list of numbers. And obviously, we can see what the problem is here, we're dividing by zero. So this will cause a problem. Um, and with Python 3.11, we now have more specific error messages. So I have to open up the command line for this because it will not show in the Python idle. But if I navigate to this directory here, and if I say Python main.py with the default Python that I have on my system, you can see it just says um, division by zero, and it gives me that line, which is the list comprehension. But if I do it with the actual um, Python 3.11 idle idle. So here you can see now it's targeting 3.9, I can copy that. And I can go to my uh, Explorer here, I can go to Python. And you can also see I have Python 3.11. So I can copy this, I can paste it here, I can say Python dot exit to target this one. And I can run main py as well. And now you can see it's targeting this particular section here. So it shows me exactly not just a line, not just a segment, it shows me exactly what part of this line is causing the problem. And it's the division, because the problem could also be, you know, um, if, if the error is now not zero division error, but some different error, and I have a pretty complex line with functions and all that, it could also be that I cannot iterate over divisors if, if I get a different problem, right. So knowing that the error is particularly happening with this calculation here is very useful. And this is uh, a major feature of Python 3.11. I think in a documentation, you can also see the differences here. So um, we can see that it exactly shows us, okay, this is the problem here. Or here we have the problem. So it targets the specific section and not just a line. This is a very useful improvement. Um, also, when we're talking about exceptions and errors already, we can add custom exception nodes. So for example, if I have something like try, and I'm going to just divide by zero, again, so 10 divided by zero, I'm going to cause an exception, I can say accept, and then I can say zero division, division, error, se. Um, what I can do now is I can add 
a note to the exception. So if I just, if I don't do any of that, so if I just do this, and I run this, you can see that this just causes the zero division error. And it says division by zero, but I can also add a note uh, for developers to know what's happening if the error situation is a little bit more complex. I can go ahead, this is wrong indentation. Um, I can go ahead and say e dot add underscore note to say, are you sure you want to divide by zero, for example, just something to help the developer or the user to troubleshoot something that says, okay, look, a common error in this particular segment, if you're here, chances are it's because of XYZ. In this case, we're just asking, are you sure you want to divide by zero, we then just call a race at the end to race to re -race this error. And when I run this, you can see zero division error, are you sure you want to divide by zero. So this is also a nice feature and we can add multiple notes. So I can also, uh, I'm going to now add the same note three times, but you can see I can add multiple lines and all of them are going to be displayed. So this is also a nice feature, um, especially for developers, uh, maybe not so much for the user, but especially for developers this is a very nice feature. Um, and uh, yeah, so the next thing, and this is also something interesting that maybe you have not thought about this because you haven't worked with those files, but there's a new uh, or a rather new uh, modern configuration file type uh, called TOML, which is used um, oftentimes instead of JSON or YAML to provide settings or configuration. So maybe I can open this up in the Python idle. I don't actually think so. Can I? No. I mean, probably I can let me just let me just uh, get the code. Okay, so I think the file should now have some content if I open it up again. There you go. So this is a configuration file in Toml. This basically means uh, what was the name? It was Tom's obvious minimal language. And essentially, this is a simple configuration file. So here you can see we have a title value, we have uh, this server section where we have the IP, the ports, we have the player section here. Um, and all of this can be now read into core Python or into Python with a core Python library called Toml lib. So we can just say import Toml lib. And we can say with open settings dot Tomo in reading bytes mode, it's important that it's reading bytes. And then as F, we can just say data equals Tomo lib dot load, we're loading the file, and then we can print the results. And you can see how easy it is to load Tomo files into Python, because you can see every section is translated into a dictionary. So we have this server, which has an IP address and a port, those are now integers and strings uh, inside of a dictionary, which is linked to server because the whole thing is a dictionary. So it's more or less um, converting this into JSON if you want. Um, but you can see how easily you can just take a file like this, which is a modern uh, configuration type of file, and you can just read it into Python and work with it. And you can also use the load s, um, the load s function here to load a string to load from a string. So I think in this case, I'm not sure about that, I think we should be able to do it like that. Yeah, we achieve the same result, we just read the content in the normal reading mode, and we take the string and we turn it into Tomo. Uh, or we take the Tomo string and we turn it into Python dictionary. So that's also quite useful for those of you who work with this type of file. Uh, the next thing is we have some updates on the typing. So in Python, we all know Python is a dynamically typed language, but it allows for type hinting. So we have tools like MyPy, which check for the integrity for the consistency of the typing. So in Python, what we can do, those of you who are not familiar with that concept yet, we can define a function, my function, and we can define um, the return value. So I can say or or the, the parameter value types. So I can say here parameter or something and I can say that this parameter should be a string by doing just colon str. And then I can say using this arrow here that this function returns, for example, an integer. And then I could just do return int parameter or something. Um, the interesting thing here is that I can do this, uh, I can define this, so I can just say my function then pass a string 100, for example, and then I can print the result plus 20 to see that it actually worked, I can run this parameter is not defined. Oh, uh, so you can see that actually works. But the interesting thing about type hinting, of course, is that we don't have to 
um, do what it says. So I can also pass a floating point number and it wouldn't be a problem for Python because Python is dynamically typed. I am not restricted to use just strings, but for type hinting, for documentation and for certain tools, this means I have to use a string and I have to return an integer. If that's not the case, it's inconsistent. It's uh, um, not the way it should be. And we do type hinting to make our code more professional. I have videos on that. And now we have uh, a couple of new things that we can do. And the first thing I want to show you is the literal string. So the literal string essentially means that we can pass uh, a string to the function, but it has to be a literal string, not a constructed string. And for that, what we do is we say from typing import literal string. And if I have some function where maybe this is very important, so for example, do some query or something, and I have this query parameter, I can say that I want this query to be a literal string. Um, and this basically means, oh, let's just say we do something and then we pass or something, it doesn't doesn't really matter what we do here. But this type now means that I can only pass if I want to stay consistent, Python will allow me to do everything. But if I want to stay consistent with the type hinting, I would have to pass a string that is a literal string. So if I say do some query, and then select star from data or something that would be fine, because that's a literal string. Um, I mean, there's no no value in really running this. But uh, what I cannot do or what I should not do if I want to stay consistent with the typing is using something like an F string, where I say, uh, for example, from, I mean, for the from, it doesn't make sense if I have where ID equals and then, you know, some value, some variable here, variable equals 10 or something, and then I say variable. So this would not be a literal string. Now I can, I can still do that without problems. Python will allow me to do that, but it's not consistent with a literal string type hinting. So that's a new thing that we can do, we can say, okay, the string that we pass needs to be a literal string, it has to be just quotation marks without any formatting without any functions or anything like that. Um, another thing that we have in the typing world is that we now have the self type, which is quite useful when you have classes. When I have, for example, the class my class, and I have some uh, initialization method, so the constructor essentially, and I give a name, and I say self dot name equals name, for example, and then I have some function, uh, let's say my, my cool function or something, and I get the self and I get some parameter and let's say the parameter is the string. Uh, this function shall now return itself. I mean, not the function itself, but the object itself. So the self um, object is the instance of the class that we're currently working with. And if I say, for example, let's say self dot parameter, uh, or actually self dot name equals parameter. That's what I wanted to do. Parameter. Um, and then I return self. This worked before as well. But if I want to say, okay, with type hinting, this is actually returning itself. What I had to do before is I had to work with a class. So I had to provide the class and stuff like that. Now we can just do arrow self to indicate that this function is returning the object itself. And then we could do something like uh, MC equals my class, I can call it john, and I can say new MC equals MC dot my cool function. And then I can just print new MC dot name. Uh, what's the problem here parameter? Did I misspell it again? Parameter parameter? What's the problem? I don't get it. Oh, of course, I get it. I didn't provide something here. So let's say test. There you go. So this works. But yeah, this part is not actually the improvement, the improvement or the or the update the new feature is that you can provide this self um, typing this the self uh, typing type or the self type for the return value for the return type of the function uh, to just indicate that it returns an object, you don't have to work with a class name anymore. So that's quite convenient as well. Um, and the last thing that I actually want to show for today, and as I mentioned, there are a couple of more things that you can look into, and I recommend you do so if you're very interested in a new version. Uh, but the last thing that I want to show today is that we can also use now string enums. So up until this point, what we had to do is we had to say from enum, import enum. And we created a class, we called this 
my color, for example, and we said, okay, it inherits from enum. And then I can do something like red equals if I want to use first of all, I can use just numbers. So red equals one, green equals two and blue equals three. So this was possible. And then I could just say print my color dot red dot value. For example, I can run this and you can see it returns one this worked all the time. And if we wanted to have string enums, we had to type out the values. So red equals red green equals green and blue equals blue. And in this case, it doesn't really matter too much. But sometimes this might be a little bit tedious. So what we can do instead with a new Python version is we can use the str enum combined with the auto function to automatically assign the string value. So I can just say extend from str enum and assign this automatically by just calling the auto function for all of those values. And it's just going to take the name and turn it into a string. And then when we run this, you can see we get red as the value for red, even though we didn't specify it. So that's a improvement that is again, a minor improvement, but can be useful if you work with enums. Um, in a project, you can now use this way of defining string enums. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.